Well, we're looking at the life of the prophet Samuel. And the people want a king. Samuel says, you have a king, it's God. People say, yeah, but we don't have a real king. Like everyone else has a real king. We want a real king. And God says to Samuel, let them, let them have their way. And so one day, uh, a young man who is the son of a, of a wealthy shepherd and rancher was out looking for some lost donkeys. And he and one of his assistants were out looking, looking. They couldn't find these, these donkeys, but he was on this mission for, for his father. Samuel sees him and calls him over and says to him, you are the one who will be the king of Israel. You're the one. And some others showed up who found those donkeys and made sure that this young man, Saul, understood that everything was okay. And then on top of it all, they received they, they, uh, some, some prophets came and, and Saul, along with these prophets, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and he went into sort of a, an ecstatic trance. He was acting crazy because the Spirit of God had filled him. And, and so the, the word came out, is Saul one of the prophets? Is he one of them? Is he a a prophet like, like all the rest. And so Samuel did a private anointing, putting oil on Saul and anointed him as their king. And then he called all the people together, called all the people of Israel together. And this is where we pick up our story. Later Samuel called all the people of Israel to meet before the Lord God at Mitzpah. And he said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, has declared. I brought you from Egypt and rescued you from the Egyptians and from all of the nations that were oppressing you. But though I have rescued you from your misery and distress, you have rejected your God today and have said, no, we want a king instead. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord, my tribes, by tribes and clans. So Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel before the Lord, and the tribe of Benjamin was chosen by Lot. Then he brought each family of the tribe of Benjamin before the Lord, and the family of the Merites were chosen. And finally, son, finally Saul, son of Kish, was chosen from among them. But when they looked for him, he had disappeared. So they asked the Lord, where is he? And the Lord replied, he is hiding among the baggage. So they found him and brought him out, and he stood head and shoulders above everyone else. Then Samuel said to all the people, this is the man the Lord has chosen as your king. No one in all Israel is like him. And all the people shouted, long live the king. And Samuel told the people, the rights and duties of a king were. He wrote them down on a scroll and placed them before the Lord. Then Samuel sent the people home again. Back in 2009, a matronly 47-year-old woman stood on a stage in front of thousands of people. And as she stood there, there were looks in the crowd, some raising of eyebrows and, and wondering. She, she looked like a grandma, just a regular person. And, um, and she was going to sing. And how stunned everyone was when this woman plucked out of obscurity and put up in front of all of Britain's Got Talent, started to sing from Les Miserables, Susan Boyle. 
And she mesmerized the entire audience and everyone was on their feet and clapping and the judge's eyes were filling with tears. There was such an astonished response to this woman who, who looked so ordinary but had some extraordinary gifts. And Susan Boyle, many of you now know, of course, has several albums out and she has, she has developed a recording career, but, but she had an inauspicious beginning. Her start was not remarkable. But somehow, because the hand of God was in some way upon her, she was put in a place where she could exercise that gift and where the world could recognize and appreciate the gift that God had given to her. And, you know, here we are in a, we're in a political season. I can't believe we're in a political season. It seems like running for president is about a five or six year enterprise these days. But there's all kinds of talk about how one starts, what one's roots are. And so those with humble roots lift that up as, as being a qualifying factor. How one begins, what the starting gate looks like for them. Do they have a a fast start out of the gate? In other words, did they have a, a wealthy family and plenty of opportunity and plenty of money to speed them along in their way? Or were they of humble beginnings? And, and that becomes a, a point of contention and, and a positive or negative aspect of the, this whole political narrative. But the real question is, does it really even matter? how one begins. Is it beginning that matters? Or is it how we end? Is it how we finish? So Saul gets plucked out of obscurity. He's just one of a family. And he's out working for his dad. Some donkeys get away, and he has this responsibility of trying to find them. Glamorous job, going out and looking for some donkeys. <laughs> and yet, somehow, the hand of God had fingered him such that he was selected. And Samuel was the one, the prophet of God, who was responsible to identify Saul and to communicate to Saul that he had a special calling. That God had put a special responsibility and destiny on his life. So despite his beginnings, he had a calling. There was a responsibility that he was to fulfill. So Samuel sets Saul aside with a, an act of anointing. That word anointing is where we get our word Messiah or Christ. He was the anointed one of God. He was the one chosen by God to lead the people. And then when Samuel calls everyone together, calls them together to recognize this, Samuel, pardon me, Saul is, is hiding in the baggage. Maybe a, a rudimentary humility that he has. Maybe he just was shy. Maybe he was trembling when he was on the stage. And he stands up and he looks like a king. He looks like someone who should be king. He's tall, he's handsome, and he's bright and he's capable, and he is set aside as one who, because he looks like a king, he looks like all the other kings, and, and therefore the people are so happy. Long live the king. Long live the king. So we're off and running with a, with a new king. 
But this was not Samuel's choice. Samuel submitted solely to the voice of God. God chose Saul. Samuel didn't. Samuel's perspective, Samuel's opinion was irrelevant. The only thing relevant to Samuel was the voice of God, not politics, not the whole political realm. And you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> we in the church, we pastors, our political opinions are completely irrelevant, totally irrelevant. I was in a meeting this past week where we were talking about where to gather, say, three or four thousand people. And the answer came about one particular church that's very large and yet is understood to be politically slanted. So a representative from another church said that his church would not go. <laughs> because a right-wing church and a left-wing church, what does it matter? How is this relevant? And I was sitting there thinking, are we not one in Christ? Are we not defined by our unity in Christ? And that when we have conservatives and liberals in the same room, that we, we bracket that off, we set that aside, and we decide that, that something higher, more important, more transcendent than mere politics is in play? The clear message of this story of the choosing of Saul when the nation of Israel decides to go political is that the prophet has no voice in the political realm. The prophet simply listens and does the best he can to reflect the voice of God and stay out of the rest of it. Let all the rest of that stuff work itself out because look at the division that happens when pastors go political. And so Saul is installed as king. And in a quick survey of Paul's re Saul's reign as king, it isn't pretty. Saul is put on this path and he decides over time that he's going to do it his way. That he has a sense of what is the right thing to do and he also has a tin ear for, for the people. He wanted to make sure he was not unpopular with the people. So he, he made sure he, he listened to the people and did what they wanted him to do and that was popular for the people. And this ended up being his downfall because he failed to listen to the voice of God. He instead listened to them and Samuel gets set aside to go find another king while Saul is still king. So it isn't pretty. But it is the path that God put him on. It's the path, the journey, that Saul in his particular life was to walk. It was his calling and his responsibility. So often when things don't go well for us, we, we think to ourselves, it should not be this way. This is just wrong. And yet perhaps if we, if we move back from that perspective, we can begin to ask ourselves, why this rather than that? I've done everything right to the best of my ability. Why did I end up in this mess? Why me? Perhaps we can begin to think in terms of our lives as simply being put onto a particular path. We each have a path that we walk. We have a journey that we're on. And it's not that we have 
the sovereignty to choose where we are going. What we have is the responsibility in the midst of whatever happens in our lives to be faithful in every step of that journey. To be openly, actively listening for the voice of God as we move along this journey of faith. The alternative, well, it's just not pretty. It's that Promethean pride. It's that, that sense of, I will do what I want to do. No matter what, I'm going to have my way. So driving down this morning, I heard this song, I've loved, I've laughed and cried, I've had my fill, my share of losing, and now, as tears subside, I find it all so amusing. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear, I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I lived a life that's full, I've traveled each and every highway, and more, much more than this, I did it my way. I did it my way. Well, that's fine for Frank Sinatra. Or maybe it isn't. We all know people who've done it their way. Who had no ear for others, nor an ear for God. They had it their way, they did it, they did it their way. One of the advantages of being a pastor for over 35 years, you see the consequences of those who did it their way. And you do the best you can to provide them comfort when their way begins to cave in upon them. The reality is it's not how we start in life, it's really how we finish. Do we each have a vision of what it means to finish well? Of what the end of life looks like? An end vision that gives us a sense that no matter where we are on this path, we can move in a particular direction, despite where we started, despite how we started. I've got one. It's given to me in a dream, normative only for me. But I'm in my dream, I'm in my middle 90s. Maybe upper 90s, maybe I'm over 100. <laughs> but the whole family is gathered in a room in a hotel. And I come in. Oddly enough, I'm dressed just like my grandpa used to dress. With gray slacks and suspenders and a tie and a vest. And I'm walking with a cane. I enter the room. And the, the room erupts with little voices. Grandpa. Grandpa. That wonderful cacophony, harmonic cacophony of little voices crying out. And the vision that I have is to be found faithful in the end of days. To be found faithful. Not to me, but to my calling. See, Samuel took Saul, not as he was, but as he was to become. He saw Saul not just as a, a rich kid out looking for donkeys. He saw Saul as one whom God had called and whom God would equip and he anointed Saul because God gave a direction, a unique direction to his life. 
And in this life, that is our responsibility and that is to understand and to discern and to articulate and visualize where God would have us go. What does God want of each and every one of us? What is the, the vision of what it means to finish well? Finishing well ultimately means a dramatic, powerful transformation of all that we are into an image that God has set apart for us. C.S. Lewis in his magnificent sermon, The Weight of Glory, it's a relatively long quote, but I want to I want to share it all with you, articulates this in a way that can sear itself in our minds as to how God views us. It's a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest, most interesting person you can talk to may one be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be so strongly tempted to worship or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with awe, the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never met a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. And he says, next only to the Blessed Sacrament, we have never been presented anything more sacred or holy in this life than our neighbor, one another. And so what does God have in mind for us? But that we might be transformed. That we might be like, like Jesus. That we might be like him. That something about our character, our life, our love, our behavior would reflect the reality, not of where we've been from or what we've gone through, but where we're going. And what is our ultimate destination? So even as Saul is set aside by Samuel, God has a plan and a purpose for his life. Yes, he failed to live up to it. But he was not forsaken. His life gave rise to a life, the life of another and another until finally God pulls it all together and sends his son to be king of kings and lord of lords. And that becomes the vision for life. Will you bow with me in prayer? Thank you, Lord, that you've called each of us. You have, you have poured out your spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And with that pouring out of your spirit, we have a, a calling, a challenge, a privilege to understand our lives, not simply as a, an accident of the universe, but an intentional gift that you will one day gather to yourself. Lord, 
may we be found faithful. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.